Sound is cutting in and out for me. I can't hear anything, actually. I only hear Dara. which is really exciting because it lets us do things like dissertation defenses and panels and discussions for a broad audience. Uh, in a way, you know, this is taking things forward uh, where maybe years ago we would feel like we might have been doing this in a vacuum and, you know, are, is anybody hearing this discussion? And now we have a platform to distribute it uh, across the country and around the world. And in addition to live streaming it, it will also be archived on HowlRound's site so for those of you who uh, find this incredibly interesting or have content within it that you might want to share after the fact, uh, there will be an archive on HowlRound's site that there will be a link available. I'm going to check in with Jose, see if we're uh, getting ready to go with the uh, content. Um, and uh, once again, thank you all for joining us. Yes, uh, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Carolyn Kenny, and I'm serving as Jessica's, uh, the chair of her dissertation. I'd also like to thank La Mama and the Culture Hub and all the incredible staff here who have helped to put together this. This is, this is a very unusual dissertation defense for our uh, Antioch University program. It is a theater production, uh, a theater production as well as um, a dissertation uh, defense. So I want to thank everybody who's involved in putting this together. Also, I'd like to uh, welcome you on behalf of Antioch University, and uh, Jessica, of course, uh, has been working very hard to get through her years in our program, the Antioch University PhD in Leadership and Change. And this is the culmination of her many years of work. This is a piece de resistance, uh, the, the end point, uh, the demonstration of her uh, project that she's been working on so wonderfully and fiercely and elegantly, and so we'll be participating in that today. I do want to also introduce you to the other committee members. I, as I said, am the chair, um, and uh, here we have virtually, we have, um, we have Dr. Dara Culhane, who is at, the, uh, at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, British Columbia. She's a professor of uh, anthropology, but so much more. <laughs> I, the list is very long, and performance studies is her passion right now. So, and she's an amazing scholar. So she has participated with with Jessica's learning and independent study, and also her dissertation committee. Um, so we have also not present, but who also participated was Dr. Soyini Madison, who is a professor in performance studies, anthropology, and African studies at Northwestern University in Evanston. Um, near Chicago. And she also did an independent study with Jessica and also has been on her committee, but she was unable to attend today. So she sent a lot of feedback, and I will represent her feedback later in the, in the, in the program in the defense. Um, we also have Dr. Magdalena. OK, here we go. Kazubowski, is that right, Magda? Yeah. <laughs> Kazubowski, Houston. She is an associate yeah. professor uh, in the Department of Theater and Performance Studies in the Grad Program in Social Anthropology at York University in Toronto. And we also have uh, my colleague from Antioch, who is the other core faculty member on the committee, Dr. Elizabeth Holloway. She is a professor of psychology uh, in our program at Antioch, the PhD in Leadership and Change. Um, and my own background is I'm a professor, I'm now a professor emerita at Antioch University. Jessica will be my last student who I'm chairing before I retire from this program, so it's... 
<laughs> it's really a wonderful way to end my uh, many years working in this program. And I'm also um, a visiting scholar at in the um, Indigenous Education Institute of Canada at the University of British Columbia. So that is my welcome to you, my introduction, and now uh, uh, we're going to give you over to, um, to Jessica. We're yours. Carolyn, uh, is this good enough? Carolyn told me that uh, she has chaired 50 dissertations, so I'm proud to be her 50th. I'm sorry, I can't hear. You can't hear, okay. No. Well, I, I uh, can you hear me now? Well, could you hear Carolyn when she was talking? What? Excuse me? It was quiet, but it was better. Okay, well, um, can you check your own audio? I am told to tell you that. Check that your own volume is turned up. Yes. Dara, can you hear me? I can hear you, Okay. Well, should I begin and <coughs> while well, my... Yes, okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, of course. Uh, I, I should also let you know the format because, uh, well, Michael is prob was ha has attended some of our defenses, but we have a, a formal uh, format for the defenses. Um, and it will be that we, we've made the introductions. Now Jessica will offer her presentation. And then I will offer comments from her different uh, committee members so she can have a dialogue with Dara and Magda and Elizabeth and Soyini's comments. And, um, and then um, uh, I will be leaving and uh, calling back uh, the committee members on the, t the telephone and we will deliberate. God bless you. <laughs> and um, we will discuss any uh, minor revisions that Jessica does need to make technically for her defense. And meanwhile, she'll be in here discussing uh, things with you. And if you have questions of her, you can ask her then. Then I will come back in and announce the results of our deliberations. Uh, uh, I'll come back from the telephone then. Okay, thanks. Okay. I've never, I've never um, had any trouble being heard before, so this is quite um, <laughs> new to me. <laughs> but okay. Um, welcome to my dissertation defense, and thank you for coming. These good, dear friends in the room and those far away streaming virtually, I don't know who's listening, but thanks to HowlRound, it could be global, which is fabulous, I hope. Um, thank you so much to Carolyn, who is my chair and without whom this work would never have been <coughs> pushed through the birthing canal of the academy into this room. Thanks to Tammy and Deb, who are my heat collective partners, and so much thanks to Culture Hub and La Mama. Um, we will do next weekend, I'll talk more about this at the very end when, when we're having our discussion, um, that next weekend in the La Mama Club, we will be performing the play that is the heart of this dissertation and that is chapter four of the physical dissertation. And um, that will be dedicated to the spirit of Ellen Stewart who pushed me towards the east uh, metaphorically in this very building so long ago, I, I won't admit how long ago it was. Um, and those of you watching out there who don't know about this incredible woman, I think you should please look her up. I also thank Ankur, who's going to come up here a couple of times and help me uh, share some bits of art in the service of theory. So, my heart is in the East, exploring theater as a vehicle for change, inspired by the poetic performances of ancient Andalusia. In this presentation, I will share my research, examine the ways a particular period of history informed the creation of a piece of socially engaged theater, aimed at instigating change. My heart is in the East and I am at the edge of the West. The research began for me with this poem, 
However, the interest in the material began, as many of my adventures do, with a lesson taught to me by one of my daughters. Emma was introduced to Maimonides in a high school philosophy class. She came home with stories about a period of time when Muslims and Jews were brought together through performative poetic exchange, and she was so excited by it that I began to research it. It actually ended up in a family trip, my two daughters and myself, uh, took to southern Spain, to Cordoba, where this play takes place in part. And as I began to do theater work in the Middle East, encountering conflict and paradox, peace sometimes seemed like a romantic fantasy. So when I chose my dissertation topic, I knew I had to go back to this ancient period known as la convivencia, the coexistence, and discover more about how this history might help me as a metaphor for poetic performance as a peace building tool. I was also interested in juxtaposing elements of contemporary life, theatricalizing and theorizing the paradox itself. So I was inspired by this quote as well, this academic quote, this scholarly quote. Now hear this mixture where hip hop meets scripture and develop the negative into a positive picture. Hill, L, 1999. So positioning myself as a hybrid being artist, scholar, activist is important as context for the research because the subject and the methodology are multifaceted. I'm a teacher, I'm a registered drama therapist, I'm an actor, a playwright, a core member of Theatre Without Borders, and um, there's my bio. Um, and I also do that. <laughs> okay, um, I haven't perfected the change the slide gesture. Is this good? Okay, yeah. Um, my company, The Heat Collective, came after trying over and over again to explain the four aspects of my ongoing work. My passion for healing, education, activism, and theater caused me to lead a collaged existence, often outside of any cozy box of belonging. I've been a theater artist all my life, as certainly all my adult life. So the language of theater is the only language I speak fluently. Everything else, including the language of scholarship, is filtered through that. So that's both an introduction and a warning as we move forward. My Heart is in the East is the script that's the heart of this dissertation. Half of it is directly autobiographical and takes place during my field work in conflict zones in the Middle East. The other half is fictional, based on history, takes place a thousand years ago. In the modern half of the play, the main character was originally called Jessica, and then I changed it to the researcher. And then I finally gave her another name, Miriam, uh, so that I could explore her more freely. So the nature of engaging in performative autoethnography and autobiographical theater is just before diving in, you, you ask yourself, oh, can I say this? Should I tell this story? You have to you, tell, have to the, tell the whole, whole story. story. I can't write my dissertation You can't gain I entrance do. into the other world until you do. I have to be careful. You have to protect the guilty, embellish the innocent. change some things. Change names. Change names. No names at all. My name is Miri. I am named for my grandmother, Miriam, who sang me Jewish lullabies. My grandmother's name was also Maryam. Her lullabies were in Arabic. Uh, his name is Abu uh, Al Hussein. Just Al Abu. He's not really here. Of course, He's I'm here. I am as much ago. here as you. Look, s there are going to be some details of the some story. Some parts I'm not will be. be some parts will be truth in fiction. Fiction in truth. For your safety and, and her my own. own. Some parts may be hard to do. Hard to hear. Sorry. She begins. My research question, how do I utilize theater as a vehicle for personal and social change, became clearer to me as I worked. Finally, this is the question I put to myself as a challenge and a barometer of my efforts and the efficacy of my work. I'll come back to this later. The purpose of this dissertation is to investigate the power of theater as change agent, using history and poetry as subject and form, to investigate the gap in the literature, the existent literature on theater and change, 
to combine all four aspects of heat for the purpose of artful service, to experiment with theater and drama therapy techniques that embrace the goal of personal and group healing through theater, which includes puppet building. I brought some of my friends with me today. And to develop theater performances, discussions, and workshops that are effective in changing perception and behavior, and that can assist in building community, awakening compassion, and provoking thought. And finally, to explore history and poetry as vehicles for change in the context of performance. The literature search involved looking at articles and books that examined various uses of theater for personal and social change. I investigated the areas of theater history, applied theater, theater as peace and justice builder, et cetera. And then I created a Venn diagram with the elements of heat and searched for literature in each category. Um, this are just examples of four types of literature from the four aspects of heat from David Reed Johnson, a drama therapist, from Keith Johnstone, who is a, one of my teachers who speaks about improvisation uh, from an educational perspective, Augusto Boal, who speaks about theater and activism, and uh, Solomon Fabres, who is a wonderful scholar and um, champion of theater. My historical research was fascinating because it was a genre of literature I'd never really delved into. I have an aunt who's an historian, and so I stayed away from the subject, never knowing I could never be an expert. I've used quite a lot of historical um, inspiration in my plays. I've written quite a few plays that deal with history, but in terms of scholarly work, it was fascinating to me, and in the chapter on literature in my dissertation, I compared examples of various historical researchers and found a wide variety of styles and relationships to questions of historical interpretation. I also explored questions about the ethics of using history as fiction. Um, I studied mainly the Golden Age in medieval Spain, which is where La Convivencia took place. It produced major poets, philosophers, and scientists. And the cooperative interactions between Jews and Muslims were deeply rooted in poetic expression. And so I extrapolated from that, uh, from that history to create the play. And we'll talk more about that later. These are just three favorite quotes from my literature search. If I can't dance, I don't want to be a part of your revolution. Emma, Emma's got to say that herself. If I can't dance, I don't want to be a part of your revolution. <laughs> uh, theater is an ally to traditional justice, Febrez, and finally, the great John Paul Lederach, who says we must reach out to those we fear and imagine the possibilities of peace. My methodology was a bricolage. Uh, I included autoethnography, performative writing, arts-based research, historical research, and performance ethnography, utilizing something that, uh, a term that Audra Cole uses called scholartistry, looking at the crossroads, the boundaries, the borders, the intersections of scholarship and arts. A bricolage is a methodology that combines multiple methods of inquiry. And one artist that's associated with this form is Joseph Cornell, who makes these amazing boxes. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. He's, he's wonderful. So I tried to make one, and I made one that incorporated all of the aspects of this dissertation, performance, history, poetry, social justice, and Arabic and Hebrew letters. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm not a plagiarist, so I have to say the little Jewish man in the corner was made by my daughter, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> but I did her best. Okay, thank you. It was very useful, by the way, and you'll see as I move on, to make physical metaphors of some of the theory. So I theorized the art quite a bit and vice versa. So another uh, methodology is performance ethnography. Spry talks about it in a, in a beautiful way that really spoke to me the convergence of the autobiographic impulse and the ethnographic moment. And that's what I really want to underline in this slide. 
and I will come back to that uh, later on, and you'll see how that works for me. The use of ethnography in my dissertation was you know, theatrical, so that the people that I met and spoke to, or I should say artistic, the creative, um, the people that I met and spoke to during my field work were represented in sketches and then puppets and were embedded fictionally in the dramatic expression of the play, which is the core of, of, one, of the, one of the six chapters of the dissertation is this play. And in that, I've embedded a lot of the ethnography. So the convergence that Spry spoke about boils down for me to truth is fiction, fiction is true. Um, autoethnography, tricky methodology this. Um, uh, wonderful, wonderful scholars, Tosig, who, who um, one of my committee members, Dara Colhane, who you just heard about and we'll meet later, um, shared these wonderful, wonderful uh, scholars with me. And he wrote a book that really encourages ethnographers to keep a journal, to keep scratch notes and drawings, and I did. I kept used sketches and journals and puppets to record the people I encountered in the field, and this was tremendously uh, inspiring and helpful. Um, so as a, as a researcher that exists within a social group, writing from the perspective of the subject, it's a different, it's a, a little bit different than what I was doing. I was doing field work, but I wasn't looking at Middle Eastern culture, or even in my, my historical research, medieval Andalusian culture as an anthropologist, but I was looking as a performative ethnographer, as an autoethnographer, looking at the research creatively, characterologically, and also very self-reflectively. So my own narratives were also um, viewed in the frame of, of ethnography, in the frame of of my own research. So I was researching my own experience um, in an interesting way that kind of had to go back and forth between self-reflection and then bringing it back to the scholarship. And historical research it was a great big part of my, my, um, my experience, as I've said before, before I was talking really about the literature and the, and the search uh, for historical material. Here I'm talking about the methodology of historical research and historiography. Um, one quote I love is Dennis who says, to write history means to quote history, which means to rip the historical object out of context. So there is no way to, to maintain absolute accuracy. Um, if my historian Anz is listening, she may be rolling her eyes or throwing something at the computer because maybe uh, a, a, a true historian has a very different relationship to the science of history. For me, I was always taking it um, through the lens and through the filter of my own scholarship and my own research. So I quite literally ripped historical objects out of context while trying to be accurate and careful about that. My research was not just done in books, but some of the methodology was, was visceral. I went back and back and back to this room at the, um, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, second floor, third hallway, Islamic wing, imagining the world I was researching until I could sense it. Um, this, is, this is from the play. I stand in the doorway of an ancient room, a replica of a room in medieval Spain. Do you have a sanctuary? This room is mine. Calligraphy lines the walls, Arabic letters in gold, the voices of the ancient poets inscribed on every surface. I can hear them. They speak in Arabic and Hebrew and just for me in modern English, a language not yet born. I want to dive into that world. Another methodology in this bricolage is performative writing. When I first heard about performative writing, I thought it was something like interpretive dance that I would be performing until I realized that actually the words are performing on the page and that vitalizes the methodology. 
So I say here, performative writing has helped me understand how to link my own poetic voice to the scholarly voices within the academy. And there are many great scholars, Pelias uh, writes about this complex view, scholarship that incorporates contemporary and oppositional logics to resist a coherent theory of performance with attention to aesthetics and meaning so that each word carries an ideological kick. So it really was wonderful to know that when you place a word on a page, you are giving it or not giving it an ideological kick. I love that. So the discovery process, <coughs> bless you. Field work, writing, paradox <coughs> boxes, drawings, puppet building, rehearsal, readings, audience response. That's the chronology of my dissertation journey and because of the typo, let's speed up and go to the next slide. <laughs> uh, field work, Iraq, Palestine, Lebanon, all of these pictures, by the way, are taken with my iPhone, so this was all either in classes I was teaching or experiences. If you come see the play, you'll see these scenes uh, embodied theatrically. Um, this is just another image from, from my travels. Um, teaching theater in a Palestinian cave, Theater of the Oppressed Festival, theater work in Basra, Iraq, community building throughout these various conflict zones, teaching theater in the West Bank, making puppets at the Freedom Theater in Janine refugee camp. The first thing you do in this process of puppet building is you make the puppet's brain. You take a secret or an image or a memory or a poem and it becomes the brain of the puppet. And then the newspaper and masking tape help form the head around it and a face emerges and the stories come. So this is one puppet building workshop uh, that, so what I'm doing with this, this form of theorizing this form is really incorporating drama therapy into the work of, of a theatrical medium being puppet, puppets. Because when you place a brain into the puppet, you're really creating a relationship to that puppet. Now the audience that you're working with will never know what's inside the brain of the puppet, but the creator of the puppet will know, and it gives the puppets a lot of meaning and um, weight. Writing, it was my, one of my independent learning achievements that Soini Madison gave me was to embed the theories into a play. Not write a play with a paper, but embed the theories into the play. Terrifying concept, I'd never tried it before, and it ended up being my heart is in the East, the play. My writing went back and forth between scholarly and a scholarly and an artistic <coughs> process where the scholarly writing was solitary, theatrical writing process is often a collaborative one. Uh, the paradox boxes. I encountered so much paradox along the way that I started thinking, whoa, I could make Joseph Cornell type boxes, little boxes that within which I explore different paradoxes. Um, so these are just a couple and my house is filled with them now. And then I also use sketches to capture the people I met both in the field and in literature and they often ended up as puppets. Rehearsal is research. This was a wonderful concept that, that Dara helped me understand a little bit. I, more than I, than I did, I never, I always, many, many years of working as a theater artist, I see rehearsal as <laughs> a means to an end, not as so much as research itself, except the early days of experimental theater when we would rehearse every play for six months, but who has the funding? So um, this was very interesting. So I rented a studio space and I engaged in a process called One Puppet, One Hour. And I went into the studio space with an out for an hour with a puppet and experimented with text and movement and puppet handling because these puppets are not, they're odd in the way that they work, uh, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, at times, solitary experimentation was more conducive to the stage of the research process, very challenging. 
to be in a studio alone, trying to understand what am I trying to say and do with this puppet? What am I trying to do with this research? Are these stories actually uh, viable for my, my work, um, for my scholarly work? You know, does this make sense? Very different process than going into a studio to make a performance piece. Quite different. Once the script was written, of course, I rehearsed it with others to discover more about the material and the research continued. Some more rehearsal shots. Several times, I engaged, invited audience in readings to discover their responses to the material. So in the process of my work, I had several different focused events. One was the scholarly artistic conversation. And so this took place in two parts. Uh, one was in a Los Angeles hotel room with members of my PhD cohort who are leaders in non-artistic fields. And the second was in a space in New York City with only theater practitioners. And I did the same material and then asked them the same series of questions and did a kind of small focus group study on how they related to the material, especially the material that was, how did the theater artists relate to the more scholarly aspects of the, of the work? How did the, how did the scholars relate to the theatrical aspect? It was a very interesting reading process. All, all parts of my heart are, is in the East were what I was, was reading. Um, and then I did an international political conversation, performed sections of the play at various international venues, performing the world, the International Peace and Research Association Conference in Istanbul, the Global Mobility Symposium, um, a Global Economic Forum, and then the script development conversation came with readings uh, as development of the script. So there were many readings that were just script development and then we had a culminating event, which was on December 12th upstairs on the sixth floor. The Heat Collective held a public reading of the script with the poetry contest afterwards and a guided discussion about the potential of peace building and performance. And that's what you'll experience if you come next week. We'll have a poetry contest and a discussion after every performance. These elements um, were incredibly important to us and we had a wonderful evening. Uh, and these are just pictures of the poetry contest and post show. That's our fine, that's fine. <laughs> that's free. Um, the process of creating my heart in the East. And so this is where things get Whenever you do this kind of work, there comes a point where things get tricky. And so this is a tricky one. Um, it was enjoyable and it, it has been wonderful and it's also been arduous because the amount of resistance that I encountered on the path of generating the work uh, about Jewish and Muslim relations was quite astonishing. And um, as Tammy and Deb, my collective partners will attest to, when getting ready to stage this culminating event, I interviewed more directors than I care to mention who turned away because of the subject matter. Uh, a prominent artistic director said, and this was uh, relayed to me, that he could produce a play about anything in the world except the Jewish, Muslim, Israeli, Palestine issue. Uh, Audiences responded positively to the topic, but some directors and producers declined official involvement. A facilitator at a New York playwriting retreat where I was working on the script said she wouldn't moderate a discussion about this piece if I paid her. She was worried about the adversarial conversation that might arise. While I was writing my dissertation, irreverent cartoonists were massacred in Paris, black men were murdered in New York, an artistic director was fired from a Jewish theater in Washington, D.C. for producing pro-Palestinian plays. Discrimination prevailed in schools, prisons, hospitals, and courtrooms. Don't we need to talk about peace and justice? Are people fearful of conversation? Any post-show discussion threatens to evoke tension, anger, fear, and other feelings about an issue both ancient and present, but doesn't American theater exist for that very reason, to raise issues, to combat fear, and revel in the green zone of free expression at the heart of a free world? 
At one point in the play, the researcher threatens to remove the character and silence the character who embodies her own inner antagonist, the voice of controversy that I embedded in the play to challenge myself. She just, she turns to him at one point when he isn't following her protocol and says, okay, your lines are cut. From now on, you are silent. You are marginalizing me. Marginalizing you? I wrote you. What gave you the right to write me? Very good question. And I put that to myself and asked, did I have the right to write him? Now, I also had some other challenging characters in the play to challenge me to see if the academy is going to accept this dissertation. Do I, how can I balance art and scholarship? So the scholar puppet who only speaks in citation shows up while the researcher is trying so hard to find her way as an ah. A room is not a thing. A, a dream is not a theory. Poetry is not summation. True scholarship is grounded in reality. Be thorough, be, be careful, be exact. Kunli Ayo. I am careful, I am thorough, I am exact. See, I am trying. Trying to what? Who are you fool? A, 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 a puppet show? It gets more and more far-fetched. Know your reasons for research. Do not waste the Academy's time with your abstract belittle hall, 2007. Okay, thank you. So he is constant and the, um, and, and uh, is a constant force in the play, pushing me towards looking at that boundary between scholarship and art. So the researcher argues with him quite a bit. Performing Cordoba and reflecting on modern times. The play mirrors the methodology as a bricolage of characters from different centuries and cultures. The modern day scholar tries to, th th not that scholar, the researcher, forgive me, the modern day researcher tries desperately to get back to ancient Cordoba and to find peace. She finally does, she finally breaks in through this room in, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and she earns a moment of true poetic exchange with an ancient poet who says at the end of their wonderful poetic coupling, I have not, he says, I've not had such a poetic exchange, not at the contest, not at a wine party. Forces are closing in around us from outside Cordoba. They will tell us apart. Poets are the last peace builders. We have to keep writing. So they challenge each other creatively. They laugh. They hold each other. And over their closeness, this sort of wonderful moment of true peace 1,000 years ago, we hear these voices. Perhaps. If, if you click on that little icon of the... Um, of the, uh, yes, that thing. Is that not working? It, that's okay. It's all right. What, what, what you hear, what we hear, um, we don't know these lines, I wish we did, but what, what you, because they're recorded, but what you hear is the voices of these characters 1,000 years later talking about what is going to happen. Um, I don't have it with me. What is going to happen later? So, it, so as you see these people playing and laughing and, and um, trading genders <laughs> and, and, and breaking custom in, in the service of peace, you hear their voices saying, uh, you know, we will, we will be torn apart in 1492. Um, we, Jews, and, Jews and, and Muslims will be expelled from Spain um, in 1099. You know, you hear all these historical things that are going to happen until you hear um, anti-Semitism will rise in the East and fear of Muslims in the West. And we hear uh, this juxtaposition of the bad news that will come juxtaposed with this beautiful, uh, tiny little period, what, what uh, Aviva, the, the character in ancient Spain, calls our small, sweet pause in the ongoing wars. Okay, so responses to three questions. 
that I got from, from my committee, which were very interesting to me. What was the most vivid paradox? How do you see arts as leadership? And how is peace a radical intervention? So we'll try to answer that. So the most vivid paradox. One of my goals was to negotiate my own complicated relationship to Israeli-Palestinian Jewish Arab strife with some grace. I wanted to overcome these emotional challenges without losing my patience, temper, or nerve in order to offer a vibrant, meaningful, and productive uh, piece of work in these places. This happens to be a photograph of me in Iraq in a, a building that used to be um, a synagogue, and I was told to not even say, oh, how beautiful, and I was this was taken of me, and then I was told not to look that interested in the, um, in the building because I, I had to hide the fact that I was Jewish and any emotional reaction to this building could be very dangerous. So, um, but going to, going to Israel and Palestine stunned me. I'm going to check uh, the time, and I'm going to just, uh, can you go back? Sorry. I'm going to just read a little bit from the play, if that's okay. The wall is a surprise. It's a surprise because it isn't. Because you've heard about it since you were a girl. Because it's an icon and a sermon and a cliche. You make your journey there because you have to. Because it's your heritage. And you cover your arms and you write the secret note and you stuff it in the cracks and you walk away from the wall backwards in respect. It's just a wall. It's just bricks. And walls make you angry, especially in Israel. And this one is maddening because the women are sequestered on one side while the men are close to the Torah and the Talit and the bar mitzvah boys and the moms and the aunts and the sisters are standing on little chairs looking longingly over the partition. It's just a wall filled with prayers, light stones with trees growing through crevices. Still, it surprises you. And when you try to go to the golden, beautiful, mosaic dome of the mount, the man outside says, just for Muslims. So you go back to the wall, your wall, the wall you somehow inherited because your grandparents were Jewish, because your mother taught you to be, because you are. You, you go to shul on the occasional Friday night, right? You fast on the holiday, you throw bread in the river, you doven, atone. But here you are conflicted and you teach a class in Tel Aviv and suddenly it hits you that every single person in the room is Jewish and that thought fills you with comfort. And then you go back to Palestine and your friends call Israel 48 for 1948, the year of independence, catastrophe, exodus, expulsion, a miracle, a butchering, a paradox. And they tell you that if you believe in them, you won't go back. And you don't understand why, but it pains you. How can you feel two things at once? You're not supposed to love Israel. You've seen the violence for yourselves. And the settlers, when they can't kill Palestinians, kill olive trees. But still you go to Yad Vashem. And you look at the boxcar and the children's memorial where the voices of dead children are read in endless succession to the light of one million candles. So simple, so dumbfounding, so true. Both sides. Both sides you want to cry for. Both sides you want to buy guns for. Both sides they expire. Both sides they are liars. Both sides they have kids. Both sides they are kids. Both sides we see them bleeding. Both sides speeding towards death. Both sides ain't no dreaming, just scheming leanings towards dark. No spark of hope to cope with the dopes who sit in offices, point guns at maps. There, kill that, spill that, grill that hill. Bill with your Muhammad, your Moses, your Christ, your improvised explosive device. Far wide. Both sides. So discovering the need to go beyond the practice of John Paul Lederach's theory of paradoxical curiosity, I took it one step further 
teaching myself and others to become comfortable and dexterous with paradox. Workshops in um, peace building performance that I teach with David Diamond all over the place, we expand on this practice and this theory of digging into paradox, which is a tool that's not appealing for most. It can be confusing and uncomfortable and people are afraid of it, but it can be extraordinary if we dive into it wholeheartedly. Theater is leadership. Let me just ask these questions. If the arts were part of leadership training, how might leaders practice imagining change before taking action? Could dramatized history be a model for peace and justice? If political leaders were trained in the arts, could that training manifest in a more feminine principle of inclusion and hybridity and a more dexterous relationship to paradox? What? What if world leaders practice role playing, placing themselves in another person's shoes as a creative exercise? What if voice and movement work could free leaders to express their authentic voices? What if the clergy were trained in the arts? Would that change the practice uh, and the structure of churches and synagogues? If doctors were trained in the arts and attuned to their own sensory experiences, would patient care be enriched? And what if leaders, if artists, were trained in leadership? Would the arts be richer in service as a result? These are the questions I will continue to ask myself as I move forward in my life and work as an artist and a leader. Is this work useful? So Brecht wrote this poem, this seminal poem, Changed My Life When I Was Young, called On Everyday Theater, and one of the last uh, lines is what the man at the corner did you would be doing less than him if you made your theater less meaningful with lesser provocation less intense in its effect on the audience and less useful so I ask myself is this work useful I always do going to the theater or reading a book of scholarly theory the same question comes up why did you say make this if I don't have to ask, then in my opinion, it's good theater and good theory. If I know why the author has done it just because of the passion or the idea's authenticity. Peace as a radical intervention. This is what we're trying to do at the Heat Collective. Um, I'm gonna tell a very brief story. When I was a kid, my dad's very close friend, Earl Shoris, who's, who's no longer with us, uh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man and kind, good-hearted person who devoted his life as a scholar to um, enriching the lives of people less fortunate. And there was one point in my life when I was sick of theater. I was like, I can't be involved in that narcissistic commercialism one day more. I wanna, I wanna help the world. I, I wanna do something. I'm gonna quit theater, which my, my children tell me I say yearly. Um, and uh, I'm gonna quit theater and join the Peace Corps or something and we're talking and he's supporting me and I remember we were in a Chinese restaurant, we left and I'm walking one way and he and his wife are walking the other and I hear my name, Jessica, and I turn around and he says, remember, all art is revolution. And um, that has been uh, really a, a in my heart ever since. So at the Heat Collective, we we try to work using art as revolution, and I'm very much in this dissertation, it's something that I've tried to, to embody. So I'm gonna end with the ending of the play because I don't know any better way to end. So will you come? And so here ends our strange love story. Without solution, without glory. Deep at sea in a school of sharks, instead of answers, more question marks. Man versus woman, Arab versus Jew, East versus West, Red versus Blue. There's some who fight to see rays of light in this dark, cold world where it's mostly night. A distant glint in their upturned eyes. Look, a slight bright gash in the shadowed skies. And through the breach, from either side fly two flocks of birds with their wings spread wide. One covey predator, one flight prey. There will be blood by the end of the day. Or, or 
the field on which these birds alight will not be the scene of a gory fight. Perhaps the gods that favor geese will prevail on these birds for peace. Perhaps the hound won't bite the fox and will make friends with paradox. Perhaps the lamb curls up with lion and Mecca fastens hands with Zion. But it's your decision. It's your choice, dear friends. How will this story reach its end? You must act fast. And choose which track and solve the riddle before the lights go black. In our vast lost choir, what deeds win through? And faced with war, what, what will, will you, you do? do? Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, for, the, uh, uh, for the committee who isn't here, I just want to say that um, yesterday I had the great privilege of seeing a run-through of the whole play, which was really amazing. So for those of you who are here, Jessica is uh, surrounded by some of her closest community members here. I hope all of you will be able to attend the full play next week oh and yeah, um, they will. see. <laughs> So um, this portion of the defense is uh, when we go into the uh, even more questions and comments from the committee members. I'm going to start with the um, comments and questions from Dr. Madison, so Yini Madison, because she was unable to attend today. That's okay, you don't have to. Um, so first of all, I want to just read out some of, the, some of the comments she made on Jessica's work on the actual dissertation. I think this is a stunning combination of performative writing, precise theoretical analysis, excavation of a vastly important moment of ancient history, and richly informed citations of scholars, artists, and activists engaged with a broad range of theater, performance, and social activism. I give this dissertation a very strong pass. The field work alone is substantial and groundbreaking. The play is beautiful, skilled, and significant, and the academic analysis is of a high standard. Jessica, indeed, has given us a bricolage or scholarstry of information and experience of the highest order. The points below are what I will emphasize as comments. The discussion of morality and imagination is nicely manifest in the multi-layered ideas of personal risk and public injustices, alongside the poetics of her jour journey as a scholar, mother, artist, and activist. I appreciate that the intellectual rigor does not suffer under personal ruminations, but makes both stronger and richer and more politically relevant. There were many examples of citations and references that stood out. Litwack is a generous scholar and artist, and I appreciate how she acknowledges names and engages the work of those who have informed and inspired her own. Indeed, there were many, but one that really stood out was her discussion of Maltebi? Maltebi, I'm sorry, Maltebi. Maltebi. And the question, what do I live for and what do I die for? This is one example of several moments in the dissertation where she not only cites the work of others, beyond parentheses of name and page number, but engages it in rich and plentiful way. I found this is r rare in dissertations. And um, the last comment I want to mention, oh, a couple more. The paradox boxes are another stunning moment in the dissertation. The images here were such an important inclusion. Again, another moment of the artist making symbolic material out of guiding conceptual framework, beautifully done. I appreciated how Litwack presented the shifting paradigm for heat into circles. This was very interesting because the dissertation took the reader on this journey also. We moved with her discovery into circles from the introductory chapter to the play and into the final chapters and conclusion. This is in itself an example of performative writing in, in, in rain, visioning circles emanating from each other in this way. It also speaks to her work as embodying performative paradoxterity. So as you can tell, Dr. Madison was quite impressed with this work. Congratulations. Um, she does have some important questions. Um, so um, 
so you can respond to these uh, questions. Where are the voices of her interviewees and folks she met and spoke to during the field work? You already have addressed that somewhat, but do you want to say a little more about it? Um, well, I think that, I think, no, it's, yeah, it's okay. I, I, I mostly um, have embedded them within the, within the story. Since this, uh, I didn't include traditional interviews, so, I, um, so for me, the interviews and the people showed up in the, in the expression of art, and it was actually her uh, prompt that had me embed them into a script. Mm -hmm. So, good. Okay, so there are a few other things that we can discuss later, okay. small things, um, but in terms of a few minor revisions, but um, I'd like to now uh, move on to, um, to Dr. Dara Culhane, Professor Culhane. Are you there, Dara? Yes, Dara? Do you have your audio on? Oh, there's, there's Elizabeth. Elizabeth. <laughs> Jose, we are, we are looking for um, Vancouver. Or, you know, now that we have Elizabeth, okay, maybe we, we should go start ahead. With Elizabeth. So, um, Elizabeth? We can't hear you. Oh, yes. Now we can. Now, yes, I can see you and everything. Yes, I, I heard everything. Good. Um, shall I go ahead, Carol? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I, I, will, I, I will add that Elizabeth is, is one of our tech geniuses in our own program, so <laughs> so it's wonderful to have her on the other side of being, being on the screen in, instead of her and being in charge of all the technology during defenses. Okay, Elizabeth, go for it. Okay, so um, Jessica, uh, I, I just wanted to read you a little bit of what I had written to you and just to thank your, your audience as well. Um, I was captured by the request of my physicians as it was to the Queen to the Queen of Queens and His Majesty um, in my home in Haiti. The best thing to play is with the organ I can give to you is prayer. And I will be doing this until the beginning of this great artistry of art. I will co-sign these letters that I will now be able to see the flow. In reading these boxes from the different focus groups, it became quickly apparent to me that regardless of heritage, history, and position in the East Gallery of the Pacific World, the play held many relevance to human struggle, paradox, and hope. And so Jessica, um, you've offered up to some of my questions in the conclusion of your work here today. So I'm going to move forward to the question um, that I think would, would be very valuable for the students who um, continue their studies in your program at Angela. And that is, um, I was really interested by the focus groups that you did this year here um, at Angela. And the, they um, were able to respond and engage regardless of their background, regardless of any knowledge they might have about the arts. And so I'm engaging students. Um, as I think about methodology, as I think about determining how to support, but even more, more seriously about their own struggle in seeing the room study with purity and with discernment. It was a practical option to giving back in the community and to solving the work. So I think of a long way of saying you engage art students in letting them know about this, this journey that you went on when you did it, looking at the quality of work happening across the world, and yet seeing beyond it in the process of performing it? Um, that, that's a wonderful question. Can you hear me, Elizabeth? Can you hear me? Okay, okay great. Yeah. Um, it's a wo wonderful question. I'm so I'm pleased to have one of my cohort members stop by here today before 
flying out to Santa Barbara to our last residency, which I'll miss because I'll be performing. Um, but I don't know if Mike remembers this, but it's a physical, it's a physical relationship to scholarship. So when our very first class was a class that I was surprised and not all that pleased to discover that we were sitting in rows facing the backs of each other's heads. I don't, Mike's nodding, so I think he remembers that I, my first revolution was to, I'm not sure it was done with such grace, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I, I really didn't understand why we weren't sitting in a circle, that it felt like when you're a theater practitioner, you're incredibly sensitive to space and to the physical relationship between people. And you know, uh, because the professors were very, very kind, they immediately acquiesced and we made a circle, but that wouldn't have been the way that that first, and th the funny thing was, Elizabeth, that it was a check-in session, so we were actually meeting each other for the first time, and I was meeting a lot of people's backs of their heads, and it was fine because I could hear everything they were saying, so intellectually I was getting it all, but I, as a theater person, wanted to make a circle and see everyone, and that is such a tiny, tiny little thing, but I think that starting from the physical, um, there's a practice that I do, and, and David and I use it in our peace and performance and peace building, we actually start with it in our workshops, which is a practice called sociometry that Jacob Moreno um, came up with, which is really placing, so instead of doing a check-in, I would have the people in here say, if you're in a, if, if this is the best day of your life, stand in that corner, if this is the most miserable moment you're having, and then make a diagonal on that continuum, and then I would go around to, to each person on the line and see how they were doing, and they could move back and forth if their if they're actual, if the, their truth authentically shifted within that check-in period so that it, it, you were actually engaging their body in, in something as simple as check-in. So, I mean, in one way, I would, if I were to develop a course for the Antioch Leadership and Change Program, one of the things I would do was break out of the sense that we are literally talking heads, that our bodies are still from, from down here, and that we begin to engage our um, voices and bodies in the process of, of learning about leadership. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah. It's somewhat. Yeah, it, it does. It's a, it's a wonderful beginning. It's a beginning, yeah. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. I uh, just want to mention to those of you who are participating virtually also, the, the, this is not an earthquake happening when the thing is shaking. This building is a, a floor after floor performance space, and so there are rehearsals going on above us, and people are, people. so, so the, the, the ceiling is shaking a bit, so don't worry about us. It's just a lot of performance <laughs> going on here. Some very, <laughs> very big physical theater <laughs> happening <laughs> above us. So, okay, Dara, we see you. Um, can you um, offer Jessica your questions and dialogue with her a bit? 
Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. So, um, you know. uh, so I just had, I think, uh, two questions. Um, the first, uh, the first one really interesting about the classical uh, experiments and, and the producers there. I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the paradoxes. Um, you know what. Okay, can you hear me? Well, it's amazing. I just can't, I can't get over the fact that you're sitting in Vancouver, Canada. And um, it's, so it's just wonderful. I'm going to just hold this. Uh, so, yeah, they were, they were plentiful. Um, the one that, that um, actually got broken, but I, and I have to fix it, but it was the one that was the first. And it was actually a very sharp reminder to myself about my own internal paradox. And it was, I it's an image, uh, oh. so it's interesting <laughs> that it broke. Um, uh, but in any case, it is the image of a little girl in extreme happiness on a farm somewhere holding a pig. And she is laughing with such deep, throated joy and completely dirty. It probably, t it looks like it's photographed in the 1930s and she's holding a giant p farm pig and laughing. Behind that is an image of a man in a, in a suit coat in a, in a storm holding on to a tree and the tree is blowing and he's barely, you can, he's holding on for dear life as the storm is blowing this poor tree. And then I have a ring of little, um, wooden uh, blocks that were given to me in, in at La Mama Umbria last summer that spell my name, but like a little kid, Jessica. And then there's this tiny cup of coffee, like a ceramic cup of coffee in miniature that is, that is, is there. Yeah. And so I put it outside my door, and so it was every morning when I get up, before I have coffee, I <laughs> look at my name, and the choice <laughs> is always there, because the par it's not one or the other. I always have that happy pig child in me, and also the sense that I'm about to fall off the cliff. So this was one sort of internal paradox. Yeah. Then I looked at the paradox um, of the woman in the, in the paradox box with the Che Guevara behind her, the, the aspect of art as revolution, she's holding a knife and a heart, so that's the paradox. It's not one, it's not a choice to make, it's holding both. And then I looked in one at America, so there was an a Norman Rockwell image and an image of African Americans in one American context. I looked at a lot of Jewish Muslim issues, so I went from a very personal paradox of being someone who can who contains both mm -hmm. those realities to very global paradoxes. And I thought it's something that, um, that might, uh, that was an exercise that I'd love to try in a workshop in terms of people being able to hold in one box two truths. Thank you. Uh, 
the fe uh, w um, the w the scholarly uh, the scholarly theater one or the more international ones? Any any particular ones that? Well, in the it was. Okay. Well, it the I'll talk about the Antioch one. It was very and the and the and the um, it, it was a it was a skewed study because I realize now when I'm saying it scientifically the Antioch group had wine. And the New York group was sober. It was one was during the day, one was evening. It's pure bad science, bad experiment. But um, but the Antioch group, I invited my cohort into my hotel room, and I had to kind of convince them that there would be beer and wine. That's the only way you get people to do things after hours at, at Antioch. Mike will attest to that. Um, uh, and uh, so I. I bought a lot of liquor and then we but then I, I read to them and I had no idea and they were sort of shoved in onto my and these weren't you know Antioch is a very these are this is these are leaders and they're leaders in that room there was somebody in the medical field there's somebody in the in the higher ed field there's um, one of our colleagues is in higher ed administration one uh, there was a just a very vast vast range of people one uh, one one woman was a an executive at Macy's you know they were these were all people getting leadership in change uh, doctorates so their response was amazing to me and they they seemed to relate to the material so closely because it was expressed performatively um, and then the group in New York Andrea was there uh, was a um, was really it was very interesting to, to see. I was very worried that the scholars were not going to get the poetry and that the, the theater people were going to be really bored by the, the theory. And it was not the case. And it was very interesting that I was kind of, ex it felt like the scholars were, were hearing things in a new way and they were happy to have that mm -hmm. different language. And that the, um, the artists were, were actually pleased to be engaged in a kind of discussion that they weren't you know, usually engaged in, a kind of intellectually rigorous mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. So it, it felt, th it, and there goes back mm -hmm. to Brecht's poem, is that I felt that it was, a use, it was useful more than for me. It, it, it was useful to them, and so mm -hmm. that was astounding, and that was partly very joyful for me. And um, I had had, mm -hmm two really wonderful moments where I've been able to express myself because in our cohort I'm the only artist who's, who's, who's a member of this cohort and mm -hmm. it's been challenging at times. I've felt mm -hmm. very lonely and twice that time and also mm -hmm. my dialogue group had a presentation and we, I, I again dragged them to another hotel room in a different city, I think that was Seattle and we made puppets. And and they and that was that was and then they each flew home with their puppet, which caused some airport problems. But they were, <laughs> it was wonderful. So it was it was great finding that connection. Um, okay, <laughs> I realize this is being televised. Yeah, so okay, no, no, I'm, that's a great question. Have the last no, it's a wonderful you question. Have no, no, it's a wonderful question, and of course, I can't get into it too deeply because I, you don't, you know, we don't have an hour <laughs> and a half. But I think yeah. one yeah. thing is I've really embraced uh, who I am as an artist. As I said at the beginning, uh, this mm -hmm. hybrid sense of myself as an intellectual artist. My plays have often, what's that word that's di didactic? And believe me, that's not a compliment in the theater, as you know, Dara. So, um, so I, I like to use, I like to get people thinking. So I have plays about neuroscience and lab monkeys and plays about Emma Goldman and plays about 
17th century pirates. And, you know, I tend to ask the audience to, to think. And, I, and I've not had the kind of success that is concomitant with, with I feel, the, the, the plays themselves. And I think it's because of that sort of hybrid nature. And then when the more and more that I work in, I'm going to Egypt in 10 days, the more I work in, in <coughs> faraway places that are, that are challenging and get the question, is it safe there, which you just kind of roll your eyes and say, well, that's, yeah. that's all relative. The more I do that, the more I realize that I am not ever going to fit into the model in the New York theater world. And what is such an amazing thing is for this dissertation, and this is really a testament to Carolyn and her work to, to push me towards this choice, which to ha is to have the, dis the defense in New York, is to come home to La Mama, where I, um, yeah. I'm gonna out myself here. I started working in this building, rehearsing. I was in the resident company of La Mama in 1979 when I was four. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I was young, but not that young. But I was, you know, <laughs> right up. So, so it was, it's coming back to this place, and that's why the spirit of Ellen Stewart, like the spirit of Emma Goldman, like the spirit of the strong, wonderful women on my committee, you know, inspires me towards this. So part of it is coming home to La Mama in, as myself, as myself fully, which is not which is a hybrid, I'm not a playwright, I'm not an actor, I'm not a scholar, I'm not an activist, um, I'm all these things. In fact, David Diamond, who's, who I've mentioned a few times, we teach together and we have this practice of introducing each other and he would always introduce me the same way and I got more and more furious until finally I took him outside and said, if you introduce me that way one more time, we, we shan't be working together again. I didn't say that, but it was, uh, but he always said, the first thing he said about me is, Jessica is a mom and she has two great children. And I was horrified that, that our students, that's what they, that's what you're gonna say about me after all, you know, the resume. And, but this <laughs> was, it was very important because probably that is the most important thing I've ever done. And, um, and that was a compliment from him to introduce me as a mother first, because that's the one thing that's not hybrid, but it is, it is part of who I am, even though my children are grown and, and don't necessarily want to talk to me all the time. They, um, there, is, there is a sense that, that, that I can come with that too, that I can come with my full self. This scholarship has, has enabled me to, to step fully into my being as an, as an intellectual and as an artist and as an activist mm -hmm. and even as a mother. I, d I, I can't, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm waxing poetic. I didn't cite one scholar in that <laughs> answer, but I, I thank you for asking it. Thank you, Dara. Thank you for all your help. Thank you. Thanks, Dara. I, I do want to mention here, we're going to have uh, Magda engage with Jessica here, but I do want to mention that all these women who you're seeing on the screens who are, are members of Jessica's committee are also uh, poets and playwrights and actresses and screenplay writers and uh, scholars. So she's, she's in good company here with people who uh, are simpatico, you know, with a lot of what she's done. And uh, so she's had kind of a dream team, you know, to really support her along the way. So Magda, can you uh, yes, give, uh, yes. Yes, uh, hello Jessica. Hello. Uh, unfortunately, uh, she is not in that area to talk. I wish we were able to have one on one uh, conversation, but I know the process is not like that. But I, I would like to begin by thanking you uh, for very inspiring and ambitious work, and also very courageous work. So um, I'm, I really admire you on your ability to bridge all the cross disciplinary material and a very, very imaginative way in which you engage with um, uh, sort of merging um, art and performance, ethnography and activism. I, I find it very, very uh, inspiring. And um, um, also, I would I, I want to tell you that I'm very honored to be exploring the dissertation, so I'd like to thank you for this and for inviting me to be part of this project. Um, I, I don't have um, any questions, and some of the um, you know ideas that I, that, 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 I, that I would like you to raise have already been somehow answered by you in other responses, but uh, perhaps um, you know, I will give it a little bit of different angle that you can approach this question from. 
So my first question to you is, and I, and I think you just uh, discussed that uh, you know, quite extensively in your response to their uh, last question. So my question goes pretty much builds a little bit on that, but I think um, we can maybe approach it a little bit from a, from a, a, a different perspective. So you have been a practicing artist for many years, uh, obviously pr prior to commencing your PhD dissertation, all that work has been very impressive to me. You've done uh, many you know, wonderful things as a playwright and, and a theater practitioner. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you think your work as an artist and practitioner might be enriching, but also impeding your ethnographic and scholarly work. So, and, and I'm aware I said that you just um, addressed some of those things in your response to Bill, especially the part about you know how, how you feel and, and look at this point um, in your career from your personal life. So, so I want you to think about what are the advantages and disadvantages and potentials and challenges of being both an artist and ethnographer. And, and you also spoke very eloquently just a few minutes ago about you know, the kind of tension between art and scholarship. And myself, as a, um, maybe I'm no longer so much of a practicing artist, but I used to be a theater director, um, ethnographer, and anthropologist, and performance theorist. I always find that kind of juggling of those different hats um, enriching, but also very, very challenging. And uh, in, in, I guess, in many respects, very limiting on uh, to your work. So I was wondering if you could uh, talk about this a little bit more today. Absolutely, and um, I just want to say that I read your book and that you know it was one of the books that Dara first recommended for me to read. And I, um, I have, I think um, my brain is, is sort of missing some, some cells. So can you say the name of your, it's sta Staging Strife, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't want to get it wrong, thank you. Um, Okay, which was uh, just so so inspiring to me, and I think one of the things that you were able to do very well, and and it's something I still don't know how to do that well, um, which is to crit critique your own work with the kind of um, sharp eye and and sharp tongue of of somebody who's really able to to see. Uh, and, and Dara has helped me with this too, to not get sentimental or emotional or romantic about the subject matter. I felt you were really, really honest and, and uh, it was uh, both fascinating and heart-wrenching, what you wrote about. What I find, because I've been a practitioner, when you say what impedes my scholarship, I think one of the things that, that impedes my scholarship is the desire to make it happen. <laughs> Is that that? What? Let me let me put it this way. I when I was first, I had to take a course in statistics. When I became a um, a, a registered drama therapist, I had to go through an MA in in counseling psych, and I had to take a a course. You know, a, one of those intense graduate research courses with lots of math, and um, it was not easy for me. But I'll, I remember learning about the null hypothesis, and I went to two people, t I can hear someone laughing, um, and I went to uh, two people, one was a psychologist and one is my uncle who is a sociologist, and they both described what the null hypothesis was, and I thought was fascinating to me is the psychologist spoke about when you're trying to prove a theory so that you can say, for instance, if I'm working, I worked in a, um, I did theater and drama therapy in a shelter for um, domestic violence shelter, and the, the lights were always very dim. And I thought, wow, if we had brighter lights, it would help the women. It would just help them. There, were, there was like one broken light bulb. I said, why can't we just get some new light bulbs in here? And then I had to do a study to see if that would work. But the fact is, I wanted it to be right. So my study, my my desire to prove that more light bulbs would help these women was skewing the study, whereas when my uncle, a sociologist, would have a study, he didn't care what the outcome was. He was more interested in the research process than the outcome. And it was a much more honest form of research, in my mind, because he didn't, he was really going with whatever the research brought up is what the thesis would be, versus let's see how we can find 
our truth that we want to happen. And in theater, we always want the show to open. So no matter what, you know, I, uh, somebody said to me the other day, well, your collective, I, we call it the heat collective, that's a misnomer. And I said, well, it's only a misnomer, you know, this week because we have to open next Friday. And so basically if it's not working, then the leader steps in to say, you know, this and that need to occur. I mean, so it's a false kind of research in some sense because you always have opening night that is looming. And I think that's an impediment, if I'm making myself clear, that the theatrical mm -hmm. process always has an outcome. And the uh, I feel that way about my clients as a, as a drama therapist as well. The outcome is healing or the outcome is performance or entertainment. So Ankur, who so beautifully, beautifully helped me today and is such a fantastic actor for anyone who can come see the play, um, it, you know, we can research all we want, but at a certain point he has to learn his lines and make a decision about character and get up on stage. So the research has to end. So I think as an artist, a result-oriented artist, I've had to, um, the relationship to time and space with research has, and, and scholarly pursuit and following an idea to the, to its end, no matter how long that takes, no matter what it produces, is an impediment I've encountered, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. That's really helpful. And so is there, I just want to throw the note on, um, what you just said, we talked about the process um, versus the outcome. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, your understanding of social change, because of course there is an intent uh, when we create this kind of work, whether you know it's art or performance technology or you know uh, art based research, whatever you call it, we sort of intend and hope that it somehow is you know going in a direction or inciting or inspiring social change. Um, but I, I guess this is also a question that I uh, frequently ask myself: what what does it? I guess what what is what does social change mean to you? And uh, do you think that It's a great question. Um, we, we've had a lot of conversations about this. Um, we are, um, we're building the next Theatre Without Borders conference, uh, uh, and, and it's based on socially engaged theatre because we felt that that was, uh, that was a topic we knew something about. Social change, although I'm involved with organizations that are human rights organizations, um, the triangle that I, I'm not sure, it's in my dissertation, I don't know if you remember it, but there's a triangle, and it's a really the triangle of cultural diplomacy, human rights, and peace building. The HEAT Collective exists at the center of it. The various organizations that I've worked with lie more in one or the other. So Katrine Fiu, who's, who's here, has done amazing work with theater in Cambodia, and that and this social change that she's experienced and has brought back to us has to do with um, with telling stories that have not telling bringing stories to us that we've never heard before. Doing playback theater in Palestine, um, I experienced working with people whose stories were not told, and their most challenging relationship to the West or to anyone outside of for instance, the West Bank, is no one has heard our stories. And so for them to hear each other's stories was very powerful. And we had to make the choice there where th not to do Boal, not to do forum theater, because they didn't need 
necessarily at that moment community expression. They needed individual expression of storytelling in, in that heightened uh, state of trauma and that they were in and conflict. Um, for me, right now, with this piece for next weekend, the goal, the, the social change that I'm looking for is actually what will happen in the conversations afterwards. So the poetry contest that, that we'll engage in is really just a warm up, an icebreaker to get people to a place of doing the real work, which is to actually have a conversation, not about the play, but about um, whether, what is, what is, how can theater change anything? So I, I talk about personal and social change. Um, another thing that just occurred to me is that, for instance, this woman here, I spent a lot of time in, in the Middle East seeing women uh, dressed like this. And one interviewer, when I came back, said to me, how can you as a feminist, um, you know, just let that happen? I said, what do you mean? It's not my culture. It's not my business. This is nothing to do with, with me. And in fact, the only way that I can understand um, this woman is to really try to understand what's in her brain. So in her brain it says, I found a poem, really understanding why she's dressed like this, and it said, I am a sacred treasure of shrouded light. Shrouded light. So my light is protected by my burqa. This is why I'm wearing this. And I, I put this in her brain when I made her because I didn't want to judge her in making her. I wanted her to express herself and, you know, fully. I wanted to understand what, what, was it, what, what, what it was about, you know, what, what it was about for her, not as a white Western woman but as uh, an Egyptian woman. So I think there's something about that paradox, paradox, dexterity of looking at how we can truly stand in each other's shoes and how we can really um, uh, grapple with the discomfort of, of crossing borders, of negotiating borders, or as Dara, Dara said, like hanging out on the borders, not jumping over them so fast. Um, mm -hmm. to, to, to have some personal understanding of what, what another person is going through. So that's uh, you know, at this point in my life, I do, I do and have done and, and will do work that has to do with getting actresses out of Afghanistan when their life is in danger, where you're really talking more about social change being like, how do I get a visa for this woman and where does she go? But right now, I want to just get people talking. So my entire um, sole act of resistance right now is to make a play that will get the audience having a conversation they might not have had otherwise about the most unpopular subject in, in on the block. But, you know, mm -hmm. how can we lovingly talk about it? And I think there are just so many ways. In the play, I talk about a woman I met whose sole act of resistance is sneaking Palestinian women to the seashore when they're not allowed to, to go to the Israeli beach. And, you know, we find our own little ways of... Um, Kat, Katrine wrote a play about the man who, who coined the phrase genocide, you know, and that was his, his social change, a word. You know, I think that we each find our own ways of doing it, but I don't have big glorious notions that I'm going to change much except tiny little things along the way. And um, in that thank sense, you yeah, thank you, thank you. That's, and I just wanted to finish by s saying in that, in that sense, probably being a mother is the most political act I've ever done because, you know, hopefully my children will change the world <laughs> and I'll <laughs> sit and watch from my rocking chair. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. I, I don't have any other questions. I just have one suggestion. Yes. Afterwards. So 
of all the nation is in very different ways and through all different chapters. So there's a thread that can bring us to, to this kind of understanding of what she thinks the contribution is. And I think um, I think it's a really um, an important for you to do so because I think you make a very important contribution in the field of design technology because what you're doing is you're bringing all these wonderful and imaginative explorations of the level of process, ethnographic process, where um, and, and, and they're all sort of performative and, 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 and very, very inspiring. And I think that's an area in, in performance technology, in the field of performance technology to your point now, that is still sort of, you know, um, a lot of room is missing. I mean, there's, there's no experimentation to the level of experimentation, but less of the level of process. So I think you, you sort of, you know, you, you really initiate an interdisciplinary And I think if that perspective could be, if that could, could be connected or grounded in dissertation, I, I think that would be very useful and, and, and wonderful. Thank you. So yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Magda. Um, so I've, I've been working with you uh, quite a bit over these months, Jessica, and so I won't, I won't carry on about, but I do have one question for you. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how to frame the question, but it does involve four very big ideas. And one is romanticism, one is imagination, one is innocence, and one is resilience. Mm -hmm. These four concepts. And so my interest to hear from you, which will help other people who are doing work similar to yours, is what keeps you going? What, what keeps you from becoming a cynic or feeling like a victim when you go into danger zones and regions? Um, are these some of the concepts or are there others? So I think the word that you um, said, the, the word resilience is, is a big part of it. it uh, uh, watching um, video when um, uh, we ISIS took over the um, Kurdistan recently when there were the ref in the refugee camps right at the beginning of that. I watched. I was watching the video and I was watching the all the adults just completely shattered and the children were playing and I was like, wow, you know, children will do. They are like. Well, this isn't home, but this is a big f open space, and I'm going to chase her just like I would chase her. And, like and, and when um, we were in Istanbul, and Cindy Cohen w is doing a lot of studies about resilience, um, I brought that up, and I was like, where do we lose our resilience? When do we lose that ability to just, you know, find a way to play no matter what the circumstances? Um, and for me, the theater is that. I, um, I'll share a very personal story. I, um, I was not a nice teenager. I was a, one of those teenagers that I wouldn't want my teenagers <laughs> to play with. I was uh, um, unsupervised and lost and had a very, very difficult home life and I was basically on the streets and I, um, this PhD process is quite an honor because I was pretty much a high school dropout. And um, I, I, my life was saved, not by a rabbi or a priest, but by a lady who had an improv group for troubled teens. And, um, I, and I remember something, and I think I've shared this with you, Carolyn, but I'll just say it, that this... Um, I was a completely um, insular and miserable uh, teenage person. And I, I went into a cappella choir with a, and I stood in the back and I sort of muffled, but you know, there were cute guys in there, so I thought I guess I should be part of it, but I was too shy to sing. But um, the, 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 the teacher noticed this and she said, um, she wrote me this note and it said, Jessica, you seem to have a flair for the dramatic. Would you help Ulysses and Peggy with their scene from Guys and Dolls after school on Wednesday? Now, why do I remember this 40 years later? Because it changed my life. Because she was the first person who recognized anything in me and said it. And from there, I went to this improv group and people laughed when I spoke in a good way. <laughs> and it was just changed my life. So 
I've worked a lot with young people. Um, we had a theater company for eight years uh, called the New Generation Theater Ensemble, which was, was young people. And I feel like that, that moment when I decided not to let the world ruin me, and it was through the theater, through um, the act of, of performance and the collaboration and in, in, in the, the magic in, in, in the studio, um, eventually led me to New York, led me to Ellen Stewart and Mama, led me to get my BFA at NYU and my MFA from Columbia and then pursue a PhD. It's all because that lady wrote me that silly note and made me realize I have a flair for the dramatic. I don't know how she saw that from the back of the room, but I guess, you know, it, it has... Um, so when I'm in difficult situations or um, when I lose my hope, um, it, it, I remember that. I remember that the the power of of the, the the beauty of theater. And one of the the hardest paradoxes I've dealt with is loving the theater so desperately, so much, and not really loving the business of it, and not knowing where I fit in the business of theater. But loving the art of acting is one of the most sacred arts I can think of and the art of playwriting and the art of directing and, the, and, and you know, deeply, deeply the art of teaching theater as a, um, as a means of expression has kept me from being cynical. Um, romantic, yeah, I, I fall into that trap quite a bit. And I, um, as I go to the Middle East quite a bit, as, I, as I'm heading towards to Egypt, next week to speak at a conference on theater and censorship, I have to look very carefully about what our censorship is versus the censorship that happens in the East. And, you know, it, 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 traveling to these places really helps cut the romanticism in half. But am I still, if I wasn't somewhat of a romantic, I, I would just give up. Life is just too hard and my life has been pretty hard. Um, but. I've gotten through some hard stuff, and um, each time it's kind of been a creative re reforming of life. And um, I go back, when, when I was coming here today, I was very nervous, and I thought, maybe I can give them something that, that maybe they'll laugh or have an idea, or maybe there's some service I can do. It's not all about me and my dissertation. It's about maybe I can be of service in some way. And I just go back to that lady in that classroom who, who thought this miserable child in the back row needs a pick-me-up. And so I think, I just keep thinking every time that I um, approach theater in this city or approach theater in the Middle East, is it useful? It's that Brecht poem. And that's really where I get, I keep moving. Because every day I have to keep moving. And every day I wake up and have to regenerate that enthusiasm for, for the new day. So does that answer your question? <laughs> Thank you. And I, I think, you know, what I'm going to recommend is that um, in service of others who are going to read your, your work or know about your work, it would be really great if you could add two or three sentences about how you keep going. Uh, so the sense of innocence, mm -hmm. how do you keep your sense of innocence and openness and how do you, you know, in, in the romanticism and the, uh, uh, the imagination, how they feed your resilience, you know, to keep going because so many people drop off through cynicism or becoming a victim right. so that they're not functioning in a good way because they're kind of replicating the problem when they're vic they're acting like victims. Absolutely, and I'll say one, one thing that, that I forgot to say. Um, the, the most innocent thing is listening, is remembering to listen, and I think that's the thing when Ankur is up here, I'm listening to him and moved by his, his innocence and his willingness to put himself out here and take up his Saturday afternoon, and it moves me that, that basically people as, Trogum Trumper Rinpoche would say, we have basic goodness in us. We're basically good. Um, and yes, a guy did hit me on the subway yesterday, <laughs> and I'm sure he has basic goodness too. But I mean, the, the point is there is that listening. If I truly listen to another person, their innocence and my innocence meet. There's a 
witness, and it's there. It's there in all of us. So, but I don't hear it all the time because I'm not listening. Thank but you. I'll Thank write you. two sentences. Yeah. About well, okay. <laughs> So um, this is the part of the program, the defense, where um, the committee and I will um, deliberate. I'll go into another room and call them, and maybe, Anna, can you help me or someone help me with that? And then you all can um, continue and converse and uh, enjoy Jessica, comments, questions, and then I'll come back in and announce the results of our deliberations. So thank you. Yeah. So Dara and, and Magda and Elizabeth, I'm going to go into the other room and call you all on the uh, conference phone, and then we can have our, our discussion. Okay. All right, so we don't have to call in at all. You'll do the call. And um, are we still being... We are still live. We are still live. Yeah, that's why we need to come to the screen so that they can deliberate in private. Elizabeth, are you trying to say something? So should we hang up? Oh, Dara, you're up? supposed to... Ha yeah. Should they hang up? And and then yeah. Car Carolyn, should they hang up? Okay, we just lost the chat. Oh well, they've hung up. <laughs> so, they're but yeah, they're oh, still they're on with Jose. They're just not on with okay. the screen. And I'm trying to get this mic uh, to get active. I'm trying to get a, um, our wireless mic to get active so that we can have the mic for the audience. Um, but it looks like. I know, I think it looks like the battery might have died, unfortunately, so we might have to do the wired mic. Yeah. Um, okay, Jose is coming to the rescue. Uh, so audience members, now is the time that you guys can ask Jessica some questions. Um, and um, let me just holler for uh, Jose. Could Blue help Carolyn make her call in my office, please? Is that possible? So Blue is gonna help you make the call in the office. Um, and uh, so audience members, just be aware, um, we're going to try to get the wireless mic sorted out, but if you're not on mic, you can't be heard on the stream. So if we can't do the wireless mic, uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll take this mic off the stand and give you a wired mic. Okay, we've got a new wireless going. Is this one? Are we live here? Are we? Are we live? Jose, Are we live? Um, can we liven this mic up? Just triaging a little. If we need to use the wired okay. mic, I'd rather move on and, and use the wired mic than hold any longer. Is All it right. Live? Uh, am I supposed Is to it hang live? Up? It's live? Okay. Fantastic. So, um, while Carolyn, uh, there we go, yay, got it. Okay, so while Carolyn is uh, calling the committee, we have um, a little under 10 minutes. And do any of the audience members visiting today, would you like to ask Jessica some questions? So Jessica, first, um, this is gonna be a little difficult, um, but um, I, I'm just, there's so much flowing through me right now, um, and I'm so inspired by what you just did. Um, I, you will remember our conversation year one, and you mentioned in your presentation that feeling of being an outsider in, in the cohort. Um, as I reflect on year one, I realize that you may have been on one side of the mirror, I was on the other, in terms of feeling a bit like an outsider as well from a different perspective. So. Um, you have been an inspiration to me personally, and um, and I thank you for that. And it came through so nicely in the, in the wonderful work you've done. I, it, it just the depth just blows me away. For somebody who is so far from the arts um, to be here and as moved as I am, um, I, I think you you did what you were supposed to do. Uh, thank in you, terms of that. So um, I'm curious as you think about your journey and um, reflecting a little bit on the question that Elizabeth asked around the bridge to kind of more traditional leadership and how the arts can influence maybe the development of leaders in, in more traditional you know, business settings and so on, mm -hmm. and whether 
whether your journey has changed how you see that whole yeah. process. Well, thank you. That's a great question. I think you can also remember that when I got to the program, I hated the word leadership. I wouldn't use it. I like the word change. I could relate to that, but I, cu I couldn't stand the word leadership because to me that means like, you know, the pale male, you know, bureaucracy up on the hill. And, and, and so for me, um, coming into terms with what it means to be a leader, taking responsibility, looking at myself as a leader, um, and we've had many conversations, we just had one uh, a couple weeks ago about this, where I've had to look very hard at that in myself. Like, mm -hmm. how, how am I a leader and how do I lead poorly and where can I give someone else the focus but still lead? You can't stop leading. Um, you know, uh, you can't, y but even if you give someone else the, the spotlight. So it is, it's really interesting, I mean, I am, Hopefully I'll go to Barcelona to, to do uh, something at, at the um, leadership, International Leadership Conference and talk about arts, leadership in the arts and, and really start to build some, some workshops around that. I think when, when David and I teach, we, we talk about leadership and we mostly talk about, you know, whatever we've taught you this weekend, <laughs> don't, don't do it at home. You know, don't just smash your way into a conflict zone and think you know what you're doing until you've established some mastery or some cultural competency. So I think it, I've embraced the word. That's how things have changed and I really feel like I now want to see how I can um, possibly teach uh, in this arena and bring the arts to leadership as well as leadership to the arts, if that makes sense. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Anyone? David has a question. David, you have a question? I saw his, his hand Crossing in front of the camera. flitting nervously. Yeah, well, um, I'm like in awe of you, okay, <laughs> at this moment. And good, it's probably a little hard to talk. Um, you're, you know, like uh, as you said, um, you're inspiring and uh, this, this, um, you know, what you've achieved even up to this point through this whole process, it continues to amaze me. And uh, um, so I have to recognize that. Thank uh, you. Incredible, incredible work. Um, I have the same questions that um, you asked at the very beginning about um, the relationship of art and theater to social change and what, uh, you talked a little bit about the level of change that you feel that you can achieve. And I kind of agree, I agree with what you were saying about it's in some sense very small, but it has reverberations that we don't, are unexplored, we don't know what they're gonna be. Um, but the, the, the place where I think that you're, the nexus of your work in drama therapy and theater and, um, um, you know, psychology and uh, art making come together is, is in the area of resilience after trauma. To me, that seems like a place where um, you really can see the change happen when people go from a place of uh, either depression or inaction or lethargy to a place of renewed inspiration. And um, so I, I don't know if it's really a question, but if, if you have any comment about um, ways in which you see um, people be re-inspired. That's to me very... Well, I think it's a real question, and I think it's a question of the community of the us that um, Roberta Levitow said once, and I've said this too many times, because I, I like she called us thoughtful practitioners, and I don't know if that's the right phrase, but there, there are a few of us that are working with theater as a vehicle for change in whatever way we say it. And it's a, it's a question we have to keep asking, we have to keep talking about it, and I think that um, we don't talk about it enough. You know, I think that you do it in one way, Kat does it in another way. I, I think what you did last summer, what, what David did, he, he um, runs the La Mama Symposium, and what he did last summer was invite all artists for the whole summer 
who were involved in this kind of work, whether it's Belarus Free Theater or um, Yalmar, you know, who works in Afghanistan, Miri, Roberto, Ken Alon from Israel, Katrine, you know, uh, it, it, was a, it was a summer filled with practitioners teaching theater and social change in, in one way or another what didn't happen and couldn't have happened but I missed greatly was, the, was us all talking to each other and meeting with each other. And I guess this is what we're hoping for at this conference is saying how are we gonna do better? How, what do we do? How can we support each other in it? And how can we actually do it with efficacy and funding? <laughs> no, <laughs> that, <but laughs> forget that. But I mean, <laughs> but there, there's something that, that I feel, that I just feel that we need to keep talking about it. And that the more, I, uh, the more work I do, the more I realize that I can't do this without a community. And, and um, I think it was Polly that said it in the film, um, Acting Together on the World Stage. She said, you know, I realize I'm, I think I'm alone doing this work. And then I realize there's people in Peru and people. But we, I, it's not good enough for me. I need to be in the same room once in a while to actually know that there are people who are um, concerned with these issues. and. And in this case, it's not so much the, the border between scholarship and, and art as the border between art and activism. And where do, we, where do we cross that border? So I'm very interested in us continuing to talk. Kat has a... Okay, we have, I think, one more question. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to uh, get Carolyn back in the room before the live stream ends in four, about f four to five minutes. So. We are uh, finishing up with the last question, and I'm going to see if Carolyn can come back in. I think you guys if they're are deliberating a long yeah. time. Is that bad? It's like a jury. If they're I taking know, a long I'll time, so does that mean I, I'm guilty or innocent? Okay, sorry, sweetie. Jess, I, yeah. I, I wish I could say something funny, but that's not part of the PhD process, right? Uh, <laughs> I think it is at this karaoke. Point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're out of the room. You should shouldn't say. Should anything. we talk about our, our karaoke act, yeah, or maybe yeah. later? Later, um, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I just say want to say how uh, extraordinary you are, and in terms Thank of you. this word leadership that you didn't like, you are an extremely powerful leader. Thank, Thank you. you, Kat. Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to say I'm also so proud of you, and I love when you were talking about your act of rebellion being to initiate conversation. Do you have any other plans, future plans for My Heart is in the East? Well, next weekend and then <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> let me just get through <laughs> the show next weekend and then yes, I'm hoping to keep I'm going. Interrupt, yeah. Okay. okay, we are back with Carolyn. Okay. So the committee has deliberated and uh, I am uh, very happy to introduce you to Dr. Jessica Litwack. going to cut out uh, momentarily. Um, I think, I like to think that this was a historic first. I don't know to the best of my knowledge that anyone has had their doctorate conferred upon them during a live stream <laughs> um, ever before. And uh, I'll, we'll just close by saying as a component of this incredible dissertation, there is a show at La Mama. My heart is in the east. It is at the first floor theater. No, it's in uh, the club. Oh, it's in the club. Okay. And I'm going to just give the salient details. May 16th and 17th, Saturday at 3 p.m. and 10 p.m. Sunday at 6 p.m. Uh, at the club at La Mama. It is co-produced with Jessica's Collective, the Heat Collective. And uh, it is a performative component of this dissertation. So those of you who watched the live stream, I'm addressing the camera. Uh, these are, that is the show that we have cited during this live stream, uh, and uh, tickets are at lamama.org. 
And I think we are about to lose the feed. And thank you all for coming. This has been a really extraordinary Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Okay.